Can you have? Yes. Oh, no. Okay, well, we have a new audio set up this week just to keep things interesting. So, um, great. All right, are we ready? Okay. Yeah, I didn't talk about that. So. Okay, I think it's like, um, Progress. 
So, Allie, can you hear me move that up so the camera can catch you? Uh, Brian, do it. And uh, first up is Allie Archer with uh, what is your presentation? Um, I have been trying to update on the additional sampling. And then we've had some newer people in, and so I need to have a backup slide too on the EPA's role on the site and kind of where we're going next. And there's been some new faces over the last couple of weeks. So I thought that might be helpful to have uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to do. All right. Uh, folks on Zoom, can you hear Allie speak? Yes. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Allie Archer, EPA. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so I'm sure All right. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. Before I get started, I did, I don't think Chris Wardell is on, but I wanted to introduce you to Tech Z. Is he on? Yeah. Okay, Chris, do you want to do introductions for our new EPA Community Involvement Coordinator? Yeah, hopefully you can all hear me. I'm in a car. Um, if you can, I want to introduce uh, Mackenzie Meader. She is the additional team involvement coordinator. Um, this morning, our home office and will be assisting Dana and Allie on this site. Um, she's making her way out to Montana right now, but she's not in Montana currently, um, but it's going to be great. So, welcome, Mackenzie. Thank you, Chris. I'm really looking forward to working with you all. Nice to meet you virtually and look forward to meeting you in person in the coming months. and EPA began 
began their remedial investigation. So we're still in square two, the remedial investigation and risk assessment, and that's what we're looking at. We're characterizing the entrance and a contamination on site, what and where are the risks on site, and then we'll move into the feasibility study. Um, so that's our next box. From there, you go to the proposed data plan. This is really small wording up here, but I have a lack of formal public comment here. Again. So the community involvement is included throughout the Superfund process, but that proposed plan is a formal public comment period um, where we ask the community to weigh in at the part of the record and we make decisions based on nine criteria that each year is evaluated against, but community acceptance is one of those criteria. So it's really important to highlight here. I also want to emphasize that EPA never wants to just surprise everyone with our proposed cleanup. So that's why we come in early, we meet communities so that you understand how we're investigating the site, how we're looking at risk, and the different cleanup issues that we're evaluating as we move forward. The next box is the record decision. That's our, this is how the site's going to be cleaned up, our remedy selection. From there, we go to remedial design, remedial action, and then operational maintenance. EPA requires five year reviews of remedies throughout the lifespan of the site. So we never fully go away. We always come back every five years to understand do any assumptions change, has land use changed. And my site in Thermo Creek, we had a new bull trout determination happen in five years, and so we have to take that into effect. And so we're able to reevaluate if anything's changed, it's still protected. Do we need to do anything different? So although it ends at MPL ablation, EPA requires the Next, I wanted to highlight we have a lot of different agencies and authorities in here, and for EPA and Superfund, it's important to recognize that we're a risk based law. So, we perform these risk assessments early in the process because our cleanups are based, based on reducing that risk on site. So, those risk assessments are both human health and ecological. They begin by looking at all the potentially site related contaminants that are present on site based on historical knowledge. So we look at site history, site records, was there bleaching involved, what chemicals go into bleaching, where did bleaching come out on site, and we get our investigation there. The risk has then narrowed that down into contaminants of potential concern, and we include that potentially site related contaminants and do a protective risk-based screen on that. I'm not a risk assessor. I'll also say we have risk assessors that are assigned to the site that take us through this process, and I'm the risk manager, so they provide a recommendation and a risk assessment to me, and then we look at how to manage that risk. Um, so those risks from the contaminants of potential concern are then quantitatively evaluated and narrowed up to contaminants of concern. And those contaminants of concern are what are taken into our feasibility study, and that's what we target our remedial actions again. So if there is elevated lead in a residential house, then we're looking at removing that risk there. You don't want residents exposed to lead in your yard. So that's just kind of an example of lead was used in the mining industry. We know it's in yards, we know it's level level concern. So we focus our cleanup actions on how do we eliminate those concerns. And then I just included this in here because it referred to the NPP in part of this. The NPP is the National Contingency Plan, and that's kind of our, our regulations for following the circle through. And that's what calls for a site specific baseline risk assessment to be conducted as a part of our remedial investigation. So just going into a little more detail on the remedial investigation, we're required to do site specific risk assessments. And those are provided by the risk managers, which is myself and the chief feedback officer on the site, with what are the actual and potential risks that we have to eliminate those risks moving forward. This is some of the data to date. I know I think the latest update kind of goes into sampling, what's been done, and the importance of it. Um, but I just want to emphasize we are EPA is very committed to moving forward with regional sampling. I just wanted to share some information from the last meeting. It seemed like folks weren't really clear on where data has been collected, and so we're building off of this data to perfect and refine our new investigation and update our risk assessments. But these are the areas that we sampled on site. Um, OB1, the agricultural lands, those first studies were completed in 2017, and they did not have elevated human health or ecological risks. I'm going to go into a little more detail on the risks from OU2 and OU3. This is just a linear layout of the sampling as of to date. I wanted to put this up front because part of our proposed additional sampling is to build on these addendums. And so as you see, RI work plan, so the remedial investigation work plan was done in 2015. And then we just created addendums to those work plans to provide these like iterative additional investigations. Our latest one is addendum 11, which was groundwater movement trade. And so this is just a list of the different addendums, what they targeted. And so we're going to propose additional addendum to the remedial investigation work plan for the sampling that will conduct over the next couple years. So it'll be addendum 12, 13, and 14. So I wanted to kind of lay out where, where that came from, and this is the basis for the additional addendum. Then we'll 
to one slide. Um, and then a lot of background. So that's all I have, but let me know if I'm going to make sense. You want to hear more about any specifics? Um, that's really all I have for a family update right now. I'm, I don't have a specific because I'm just reading everyone, but yeah. And then there's a question. What's the is there a negotiation process that if the POs can say no, does we don't think so? Is it walk through that just a little bit? What does that look like? Where do the POs stand with, you know, our requests and our continual church revision terms of the meeting between one and one and one? And then you guys agree to it. And so, where, how does it work if the POs can say it's on Well, so I, I um, couldn't expect, I didn't know what we would get back, and they didn't say no. Mm-hmm. So they came back to the proposal for each of the meetings while they were at the table. Um, and now we're just working on the data. So they basically have come to the table and they wanted to conduct work to address the additional sampling. And so we're going to be working through those specifics, but EPA has committed to answering the concerns presented. Um, and now we're just working through what they're going to do. And we know, I feel like we know exactly what everyone wants because we've gotten those to the table. We've put the work in on the front end. The PR can come back to us with, we want to do work. We want to move the site forward. Everyone wants, for different motivations maybe, to get out of here as quickly as possible. We want the best thing out for address those concerns. Not as quickly as possible, but efficiently, I would say. We don't want to lose time and keep dragging our feet on these things. So I think it's, it's, I'm really happy about where we're going. Um, we just need to keep working through it and, and be as efficient as possible. It's definitely not just as fast as many time frame, but they came back with proposals for each of the DTO tables, and we're confident that we can work through addressing concerns fully. Yes, I feel curious about these what kind of tables. Yeah, so a lot of the work happened this time because of the work we tried to make over the last couple of months, where we sat down with the Missoula County, National Regional Trustees, the tribe, to discuss how can we address these concerns specifically. I think that we, EPA, felt like we wanted to really understand that when we go out to collect data, we're collecting the data that the county and trustees would like to see. So a ton of that work is data quality addressing tables, which are what EPA uses to build work plans. And there, I think they've been out to handout before, so I mean, so they're like, step one, state the problem. The problem is, historical situation at a vessel park with river play stuff too. Like it's how do you work through addressing answering the question of these primary studies. So it's kind of like the scientific process of collecting data. The trustees and county and tribes were a huge part of developing those tables is exactly what they wanted. So we have the app and so we're using those to get a work plan developed. Okay, so how long will this go? So my question is um, you're going to the ERP saying that they worked really hard on this table. Yeah. They suggested this is what they want to see that, you know, data tell us. Yeah. How many negotiations will happen before you say, well, it's going to be like you that the ERP wants for this particular sampling plus we're going to go ahead and do it? So where, where in that timeline? Because I think you see this going round and round. Right. Where does the EPA draw the line and just say, okay, it doesn't look like we're going to get so they buy in the mix on this particular one as we move forward. Yeah, I think so right now they get the first we they have the enforcement agreement to conduct the work. And in our enforcement agreement with them, we say it's like with documents too. We say here's how we want it edited, they get one chance to do it and then EPA can make the edit. So we ask them to do something and I think there's a lot of technical experts, experts on both sides, so we kind of think through what's the best way to do this. We have that for the DTO tables, but our first thing really was what, like, we're asking to do all this work, show us your proposal, and they showed us proposal that they're willing to address the DTO tables. And so now it's just the nitty gritty of timeline work plan. We still want them to draft the work plan, we want to review it. I think we just need to brief upper management on what's going to go forward with all sampling, because we know we can include additional wells and additional contaminants immediately. And then we're going to work on our source characterization work plan. Meantime, we want to schedule meetings with the whole working group. And so we're just internally looking at that time frame to make sure that we keep everyone informed while working through the work plan. But it's really like they can ask and then they can respond and then we can determine, we, just, we have control of the next step of what EPA needs to get done. But it sounds like they, their proposal is to address everything. Yeah. Yeah. Address the 
um, presented in a keyboard table. Yeah. So it's very common on keyboard. I mean, EPA, regardless, is going to be plugged in this for those projections. And that data will be very large and numerous projections? Yes. So there, and I, I don't have a firm time frame, but we were putting that into like what do we need to run the statistics to get the data, you know, to have our risk assessor contracting. So the EPA did the risk assessor risk assessment. So just they will be incorporated and, and that's how the time frame to all the way out. So, so just getting those replies and that's good. So I should have a few questions. Yes. <laughs> what do you think is in the hall? What do you think is wrong? In the hall? Yes. Like okay. what, like what, what, what time frame is wrong? Oh, September October. Mm -hmm. September October. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I would just leave it on that and look really quick. But we've already submitted, we already have a list of well being analyzed based on the DPO table. So we just need to include that in the amended item 11. And so we just wanted to, to make sure our managers on board does pushing that forward. It doesn't include the additional well app, but drillers are tough to get by right now anyway. And I think if we can firm our work plan for the fall, then we can work on a larger agenda and addressing the full groundwater for next year. What does the EU own to your quality? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can share the first thing. You said they are with the bill. Yeah, not the fall, sorry. So I think that's why I just wanted to make it is like we're able to get out with the existing well more, more locations and more contaminants included, like the partners. But that we need, we're going to include a larger work plan with the additional well for 2024. Okay, so you have sampled the existing well yes. for additional contaminants this fall. And additional wells, because our in the narrow list for example, oh, we're adding more wells, well, the okay. existing wells, sorry. And then you're going to add wells in 2024. Yes, we'll start drilling in 2024. Is there a time frame for that? The drilling for the 2024 well? I bet we'll say spring. So we'll see. Yeah. The number 12 comes to my mind of how many wells were initially for sampling. Is that what you're going to sample again? And then more than 12? We're going to, I don't know about 12, but we have a focused monitoring right now that will be expanded. And I, so I think we have 52 monitoring wells. I don't think we have every background in there, but it'll be. Closer to that end than where than zero. <laughs> I don't have the exact number, but we're expanding the existing monitoring wells, which they correct the same new wells, which is confusing, but existing wells with additional contaminants in all. Starting with your report. All right, any questions from the group here? Any questions from the Zoom folks? There's a lot of information. May I try and paraphrase everything? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what I think I heard was uh, a great uh, presentation. Your, your slides were great. The picture, was that representative of true soil composition or was that just uh, a representation? So we have water flow. Yeah, it shows a different aquifer lenses. Right. But yeah, it's a free down there. Okay, so we have cobble and then clay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then what I heard about the uh, the, the plans uh, sampling that what what the technical group put together, the request went to PRPs, and they said, sure, we're going to do what we can. But we'll give you our work plan rather than your work plan. I, yeah, I, we haven't seen a work plan, just a proposal to address the DQO table mm -hmm. at a very like high level. And so we felt confident that they're going to come to bat with us to get work done. Yeah. And when we get more specific, which we know will be comprehensive to address the concerns presented, but we'll meet with the technical working group. Yeah. And then, is there a time frame for that presentation from PRPs? Um, I'm kind of waiting to hear back today on 
put all four of us go ahead, um, and I think we will just like prioritize the fall sampling event and then start working through. We know we want to get out and do the source conservation ahead of wastewater pathways, and we'll put that up ahead of wood and groundwater. So those two are our like big priorities. Um, but that's why I said in the next couple weeks, I'll be meeting with second working group. Um, and they've realized that like, summer is so busy that it might be not everyone, I'm not going to call everyone at once, I think, but just kind of I get a hold of everyone as I can and um, kind of lay out the expectations and timelines. Uh, but I do think that this is going to, it's so much smoother because you guys have put in a ton of work into it. We have very explicit directions that need to go to people, so it's not like we need a ton of back and forth. We know exactly what we'd like to see and what fish we want to answer. So I just want to extend the thank you because I think that was a lot of hard work. And we're very appreciative, and I think this is a great next step moving forward. Um, and when I get specifics, they will be shared out as I get them. And you don't need a forum to make a decision. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any questions from the Zoom group? Sure. Okay. Oh, one. Very good. I've got one question. It just um, but it might be helpful for folks to understand. You mentioned that this was. Kind of the first phase of additional sampling, we just need to, you know, how would, how the second phase would get implemented in the next year. Yeah, and I think that we're like still looking at the larger time frame, but we need to get the data back from the source information. I think that even informs some of our wastewater pathway. I was looking back at that language of just building off of source information to to find some wastewater pathway, and then we have a phase two, which is impact the Columbia the River. Which looks at fish, osprey, and um, in the park book as well. So that's going to be built off of our data results that have come in phase one. And then that might be for 2025. So. I think so. I think, yeah, I think um, that would be the end of phase timeline is like 2024 huge data collection year. We're going to wrap that in build the open picture. And that's where I'm trying to figure out how quickly we get that. We'll have data back, like how could we get a back up with our in this assessment? Um, and then the phase two planning at the end. Super. Bob, did you have a question online? No, I just uh, agree. I'm, I'm hearing things that I think are good uh, for service. I was concerned about some additional sampling needs, but in hearing from Allie, I think, you know, our timing on that question is, you know, perfect. It's being answered. And we would love to work from the Forest Service perspective with Allie and EPA and the technical working group uh, to make sure that everyone is comfortable with what's going on. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. For those folks who don't know, Bob Witteris is the uh, regional environmental uh, engineer for the uh, U.S. Forest Service Region 1. And okay. uh, do you want to try to do introductions? We have uh, 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay, you can do that. Next up, Elena. Yeah, hey, everybody. Trying to pass off some of the tech duties. I still haven't touched my phone in a way. Okay. So, I'm going to try to keep this. Simple. There's a lot of acronyms and there's a lot of complicated pieces involved with super funds and involved with, you know, all the different pieces we're talking about. But there's a new folks in the room, there's new folks here. And so I just want to go through, like, why it's so important. And we're so grateful that the EPA has worked to work with the PRCs to make this happen. And so it does, it's not as pretty, but the longest word I'm trying to use in this presentation is characterization, and that's just wrapping your arms around the contaminants on that site, the extent, how much, where they are, everything like that. And so, you know, this is the site before it was built, 1937, on the side there you can see there's a good amount of river activity there. This is the uh, University of Montana Grizzly Stadium uh, for people who are football fans, but it's also a 
just a generally decent understanding of a space. And so what we have here is solid waste space of A, uh, that's a dump, and then, you know, the different dots are different sampling points. So orange is soil boring, the blue and black is monitoring well, and so it's just giving you and, and trying to give you an understanding of the space and the scale of what you have. Because this is kind of what some of those dumps look like, so they can be highly different. And so when you're characterizing it with those stamps, with those number of like holes and things like that, are you catching what what's in there and what's being put down? Is it fair? And then, you know, if you go at that, these are some of the samples that were taken in two of the different ponds. You can see at that they're very well with the samples that are to me. So, you know, our request for more sampling to characterize the site is rooted in the data that's been taken on the site. And this is way too complicated, but all it's saying is see these chemical structures? One's looking a little different than the other. We tested for one, but the other one is what's really driving the concern with the fishery. That's where people are like, oh, we do not need that fish. But we haven't tested for that on most of the sites. They did certainly in this main industrial area, but not the places that are closer to the river. And so that's what we're excited about. That's what Allie talked about when she met the later PCB. So that's this is uh, the super fun snake, and it just kind of shows where we are in a different way than what um, Allie had up, but it's the same thing. And so essentially it's just saying we're still at the remedial investigation and the risk assessment. And so um, this is an old slide, but it's, it's important before we round that corner that we like figure out what's there. And so, like Allie said, it's risk. And so it's all of these hypothetical future users. So who's going to be there? What's going to happen on the site? And how are they going to interact with contaminants that can kill them or increase their cancer risk or do something like that? So they're looking at a lot of things. But it's based on grids and things across different pieces that look different. You know, you got, you got floods, you got a landfill, you got some former channels, you got there's, there's it's a big site. It was originally 3,200 acres. What we're looking at now is more like 1,000. And then you're gridding it up. And that's where, when Allie talked, she said, two grids have a problem. And so, you know, I could point to the grids on here, but that's not the relevant part. The relevant part is that the grids go over different things. Um, you know, this big red area is here and here. And so, how is that capturing? Um, because, you know, these are, the, with the sampling that's sent today, these are just the list of the different things on site that are of concern. And you can tell they're different in soil, groundwater, surface water, sediment, and fish. But they're different, and that's based on the sampling today. So we're kind of like, well, what happens with the other stuff in the other soil? You know, why is this in soil and not groundwater? And there are some chemistry reasons for that. There are some site operation reasons, but... We'd like to get a better handle or a better characterization of what that looks like. There's also different, you know, risk and dose and a lot of like terminology involved with toxicologists. I'm internally grateful that Todd Seidman in our office has a PhD in toxicology because this is not my favorite part of science. Uh, but it's important and it's what drives the risk. So understanding those differences and, you know, like the different additional cancer risk that DEQ is willing to accept versus the additional cancer risk that EPA is willing to accept and how the state plays a pretty key role in and also bringing forward these risks to the state. So after we go through that process of those risk dose things, this is what comes out. This is what is currently seen as excessive risk to future users. So it's I cut down a lot except for this one time next to Camper next to Pond 17, but that was kind of like one spot. So, you know, this this left all of us still concerned, and this was kind of came out before Addendum 11, which changed the groundwater from sampling all the wells twice a year to some of them not at all, the, at all and some of them more in a limited fashion or not as many contaminants. And that's something that happens as you move forward in the process, but. Um, 
it's also what drives the site specific cleanup level. So just because there's risk or just because those things came up as like drinking water is a concern doesn't necessarily mean that the groundwater will be cleaned up with the assessment standing as it is. And, and so that's important too. Risk is driving the process, but risk doesn't dictate cleanup. And, and the sampling today will also identify the site specific cleanup level. So we're not supposed to, again, you know, we, we kind of mentally think about this and compare it to Milltown or like Pine Sash or things like that. And each of those have site specific cleanup levels that are based on what was found in, in some of the original remedial investigations. And that's something by the record of decision to where it has to go up to those five year reviews that I was talking about. Once it takes those levels, then that's when it can start to get to the did I get something wrong already? Well, I, well, I just like, I just like to get a little bit confused with some of the units, but I think that um, it, how it's cleaned up is both, like presented in the feasibility study if you look at a range of cleanup options. And so risk is addressed. So this report, I mean, this is just saying like, it doesn't mean it's like eliminated or removed completely, but we look at a range of cleanup alternatives. And so I would just say like, that's a key place where community the way to is as well as you guys have, and you guys all know the community the way that's like really going to be behind like, this is, this is the no risk, and here is the range of cleanup options. EPA is tasked and has the authority to address excess risk, but how we do it is identify the excess for a range of options. So it, it is addressed, but I think that cleanup can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. 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 Please interrupt with stuff like that, too. Mm -hmm. I certainly, you know. Um, but anyway, you know, so the risk. Will determine where cleanup is targeted, and where cleanup is targeted is also dictated by the sampling. So, with fewer samples, there's not, you know, that's where you start. And so, how I put this figure back up, and like, let's say that soil boring in the middle of Ruth Stadium is contaminated, then you would dig it out and sample and come confirm, get to different levels. This is all hypothetical. But just so people understand why this is driving some of the value and importance in polar characterization. So you, you then sample the sides of that pit. Oh, those two sides, the north side and the east side, were, were you know, didn't meet the level. So then those are dug out. But then, you know, what does that mean for this larger pond area that has the same position on the street? You know, so some of that. Is complicated, and this is a hypothetical, but I'm just showing you the size of the site and the size of how some of the um, remediation work as far as like finding where it's contaminated and taking it out. And so that's just why it's really important to get some more samples on a big site because although the uh, site you know, conversation happened, you probably come out with the EPA in, in 2010. We also have folks like Larry Dewey. We also have folks that we did interviews with. Um, and so that's, that's driving some of our concerns. And so, um, you know, throughout the different agenda and all of the data processes, um, the community and the trustees and everything have participated to a big level, um, asking that co-cleaner PCBs, you know, the different kinds of structure we tested for and that we, do more fish sampling, and that ended up leading to the Do Not Consume Fish Advisory. And so, you know, it, it, this request for polar characterization is rooted in those letters and everything. And, and what we're grateful for is that there has been a turning point lately where EPA is, you know, is, is curing that and working to better characterize the site. And that's where we're really excited because all of those requests are just rooted in, like, me starting off or anything are rooted in all of these letters on all of the different agendas that have happened at the time and point that that, that sample is occurring. So, you know, I don't need to keep going through that. And so that's where, too, our big focus is the groundwater conceptual site model. And so, you know, we're grateful to hear that. Um, we're looking at those pathways differently, but the other part of this with the conceptual models is just where the pathways are. And so, you know, trying to identify in here um, how this stuff works. So, oh, 
in my computer. Anyway, those, that's just more of the background. I think that's why it's so vitally important and why we are, again, you know, um, very interested in uh, the progress that I made and talking and like confirming the sampling timelines and guidelines and work plans moving forward in the next couple weeks. And just as importantly, that this information will be incorporated into the risk assessment because of the value and importance that that would drive in moving cleanup forward in a more holistic manner. So, yeah. Any questions? I know I used the EQ as an acronym, but I think I stayed away from a lot of other ones. Okay. Elena, would you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Lynn Evans. I'm uh, with Missoula County. I'm a hydrogeologist and environmental health manager. Yes? Very good. Thank you. So we have the county and we have the federal government involved. You can have it involved in uh, the snowflake itself, which is the vaccine. And, and that is uh, very much appreciated. Yeah. Hey, and I know that you may not know this, but I'm just wondering throughout the industry, why are cleanups being unreal? Why are they just clean? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I know, I don't, I find it to be like history how and you know that the EPA with a lot of like the water standards regulations that we just had a lot of this case threshold and so we're developing what's a protective exposure to a contaminant knowing that we all are exposed to different contaminants and so that's kind of how EPA regulates across the board. Um, and so I think that that's how the law form is that there are multiple amounts in the world that EPA controls the company's exposures and so knowing that that's what we have to face with the FDA too. Um, and now we work, try to work with the other state agencies that have a more deeper path to restoration. Thanks, <laughs> Robin. So I, I, I would say that it's probably the best job. Yeah. That would have been the best job. Everywhere. But there are, you know, like Valerie was saying, there is a unique position that is impacted. Um, so, yeah. 
don't think about it. Just know that if you get to the house here, you can write down the jail from the store. But there are animals in here. Or what happens if the flip, if they do find the flip plane, which they seem to do that which is almost every five years or so. Um, and all of a sudden, land was, was considered clean enough by being included in the flood plains, no longer included in the flood plains, and the known to the people that live there. So your follow up thing has to now come and do a study, or now they got to do that again. And we're running on that station, we do a previous assessment. So that will be that's in the very first day for a look at what future land we take into account still. But we can only know what we know at the time. But then, but that's why we don't have a vote. It's, it's no longer the plus thing we have. For some reason, the plus thing we have. We would go back and, and it's not going to go back and we're pouring out. We can all be to residential where it was just going to industrial. Uh, but now the landowner is going to have to go there to residential. Yeah. For, for EPA's requiring that before they left right there. So, so, uh, so I'll just put it off one. Then if the first side you want to be is cleaned up to industrial, it gets rezoned to residential. Whoever follows the first has to clean it up. Mm-hmm. And the first don't have to be. No, they, they are on the hook. They're on the hook. Yeah, so they have to Unless they sold the land and we have to move the property. Well, they don't exist. Well, the because they're not. So they have to be able 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 to and in enforcement agreement right now, we have a new enforcement agreement that they have to meet those kind of requirements and remain protected. So if EPA goes back and determines it's no longer protected, we still have an enforcement agreement. Thank you. But the new enforcement agreement we don't have. Yeah. yeah, and that's also a big part of why we feel like county is involved because, you know, if there is something like a controlled groundwater area or a land treatment unit that limits the use of that land, that kind of limits the vitality or the, the ability of our community to grow and adapt to, you know, what it needs in the future. And so that's too where we've had experiences in the past moving the land treatment unit unit and having to, you know, put a tax increase of financing on it. And so, you know, to some extent, that's why we're happy to participate and continue to participate to the level we do is to protect the interests of the community and ensure that cleanup allows for like full development moving forward. No further questions from the group. Uh, any questions from the Zoom folks online? Darren from Winnegars. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I didn't say you didn't have any yeah. uh, uh, Thank you. I think we heard from the board service. Jen, you want to Bob is next. Bob, are you still there? Yeah. Uh, do you have a presentation or anything you'd like to say? There we go. Well, based basically, what I, I would like to say, and I could, you know, maybe present something, but what we want to make sure is from the Forest Service, which is you know, our goal is stewards of the land, and we are there to serve people and the resources that, you know, are there. And uh, what we were kind of concerned, and, you know, which generated a letter from our regional forester, was regarding the amount of sampling that was done to verify uh, what possible contaminations were in the area. Uh, as many of you have seen uh, the aerial photos, we are looking at a complex area that Mother Nature sculptured to various flows of there's changes in river patterns. Those river patterns, in our opinion, is a conduit for you know potential contamination should a source of contamination exist in that area, and those. Uh, 
control patterns are very complex and require a great deal of sampling to verify that statistically you have verified that there is one is either a problem or not a problem. So that is why we generated a letter uh, from the Forest Service to EPA was our concern of, you know, the correctness in the amount of sampling that was to be taking place at the site. Uh, from what I hear tonight, it is EPA stating that, yes, additional sampling may be necessary. So we are in support of that. And we would like to be partners in that process to make sure that you know, the resources that not only the Forest Service has, but for example, the state of Montana, the Montana Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, has, you know, protection from, you know, what has transpired in the past. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Bob? Excellent. Oh, Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate the, the information and the comments from the Forest Service. Yeah. Well, thank you and for the opportunity to be part of this. And I think as a working group, you know, the you know, technical group, EPA, Forest Service, and other entities, uh, I think as we move forward, you know, we will do good, great things. The plan. The plan. Thank you. All right. Uh, next on the agenda. Yes. Oh. <laughs> would you like to talk about gender? Would you like to introduce yourself?
as well as arbitraries, and it's really reaching a lot of um, a pretty good demographic. And so I think that would be a great thing. I've got a whole bunch of communities um, that I can share that has all of those events that I think are, are really important. I personally have heard um, really good comments about just the all informal itself, and people felt really comfortable mm-hmm. in asking questions. They didn't feel like there was a panel of fun, the circle, I think, was really mm-hmm. indicative of unity and working together as a community. And I felt like that was, I was really proud of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think comments from the internet. So, so it's like Ted is going to put together some community events, or at least uh, attend community events. Anybody that would like to attend, uh, we wait for the minutes to come out or notes from uh, our secretary about the, the uh, attendance. Uh, my wife was here with me, and I think that's quite a bit of information to really appreciate it. Uh, Great uh, slides. Uh, the information that we have laid out uh, is right now for our own. So, feel like that much. Uh, thank you. And then, uh, Elaine, do you want to talk about the uh, possible legislation? Oh, I mean, Mr. Carl, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think, I think we're just hoping to get it. Yeah, I think it's probably like the first thing I'll do on this joint side. Do you want to introduce yourself to her? My name is Tom and Mark. I represent the district of the Food Farm Business State Legislature. And um, one of the things that passed legislative session was a, um, a bill, a post study bill, basically threatening the Durham Committee to um, like, look into its current engagement as perfect. So, what we've done now is um, the first meeting of that committee is going to be July 26th. That's the kind of organizational. Meetings for mapping out the next uh, you know, year and a half. Melinda and I have had some really good conversations specifically about DEQ and the DRC, which are two state agencies that um, we, we kind of narrowed in on the most specific um, asks of those agencies. Um, and that's something that we're going to be having in our committee work with leadership of those agencies to try to get answers. And I think that's something we can next meeting or something. Go into a little more depth of what we'd like to see the state agencies do, but what we have been compiling is looking at all the different relevant um, state laws and regulations, like the Dam Safety Act, for example, um, directly uh, governs the firms, and that's under the DRC's purview. We really haven't seen much engagement from the DRC, and they have a lot of responsibility on that front, including liability issues. So that's something that the DRC committee. Um, as statutory authority over those agencies. And so after July 26th, what I'm hoping to do is get um, a meeting here in Frenchtown in the fall with the legislative actors to meet the site. A lot of them, especially uh, ones that don't represent the areas in the western part of the state, don't have a great sense of you know, what the layout is, what's happening here. So, you know, um, I will work with the Trying to find the time. And, you know, of course, it's crazy trying to arrange all these legislative schedules, but we will see if we can make it something in September, October, somewhere in that window. Um, it would be the goal. And then uh, we'll be also fight for state agency uh, leaders so that they can actually see what we're talking about with these uh, day lives. Uh, 
we do here. Like, we've got down those chairs. So, I'm Jerry Dillis, and I am part of the CAG admin team. Um, we wanted to go over the operating procedures for a couple of different reasons. Um, they're quite simple, and we just wanted to um, kind of put them in front of people so that we could go over them and make any sort of um, refinements just to remind people that, you know, our our goal and our objectives are to have a complete and total understanding of the site and how do we do that. We do it by communicating. We do it by sharing information. We do it by um, public comments. Um, I think that we have commented on 11 different the EPA, and we've done it with, um, we've done it with, and I, I think that that's really important to continue that. And so, every person that comes to the meetings um, is expected to share information and to um, make the group stronger and better together. And we haven't always agreed, but I think we've been very collective in our approach to um, I think that's important. Um, some of the things that we really would like to do more of, and Jen spoke to it, is um, we feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect with trying to get people to understand the process, the super fun process. And it's a difficult thing to tackle because it's complicated and people, um, it's confusing. And I think a lot of people, you know, I've been in this area since 1993. And, you know, I've seen the mill site as well as half the I've seen it at the state that it is now. And I think a lot of people really feel like they want to see development and they feel like it takes too long. Well, it takes too long because it is complicated. And so getting people to understand the complexities of it, the science, why we do what we do, in a way that is um, easy for people to understand is a big part of what we want to do with our operating procedures, and that's okay. So I think that's good. Um, I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to look at the operating procedures, if there's any kind of, um, if you have suggestions, happy to add to it, anything? I thought it was good. Thanks for doing it. I saw the control of it. A good reminder for aspects of what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have bylaws, we have work groups, we have family team. We're always here to manage and facilitate all tag meetings and to make sure that we do exchange information. Um, we do want to keep the group focused on roles and purposes of the K. Um, Ellie, one thing that I think would really help us a whole lot would be, and this is basically our job description right here as a K. This is what we live in grade five. I think we're pretty honest with it, but I would love to see job descriptions of what your community involvement coordinators are and really have more of an understanding of what they're supposed to represent, how they're supposed to do it, and, and really get into the weeds a little bit about how we can work better with the community involvement coordinators to get the community more involved. We've talked about outreach for a long time. And I think it's really coming to a point where we really just need to execute it. Because I don't, I, we, we just need, we need more. And, and I think it's really important that if we can manage expectations with what the community involvement coordinator's job descriptions are, it would help us do our job better. And so I feel like that's a great way to communicate together. So. But you could get those done. Yeah. yeah. I, I uh, wrote down a few 
transmission of that power. Well, there's a couple of great things that you're going Well, let's look at the date um, for September because I, I want to make sure we have something to communicate. Well, it's the fourth. You just don't want to use your technical team. Yeah, I'm on the Okay, so we're going to set the next step. Okay. June 4th. 4th. Well, we're all in the whole thing. Okay. Uh, is there any information, comments? From the folks on the internet. I think we have one in back here. So, yes, we got it. So, we just have some underloading music director of Mockers. Those of you that are aware of Mockers, the student organization that is at the University of Montana, the first nonprofit to provide volunteer and freshman campus director, Bradley Smith, also at the university here. And we are we're going to start the summer this summer and spring after talking with a whole bunch of other students professors. Um, our student course director is excited to work on the issue. So we're actually going to go to your uh, talk to members of the club about the stone to let them know what's going on and you know, calling for the most of our organization and actually take action. Um, so I think we're all on the same page here. We want to see you know, more sampling. We want to see the burns removed. We want to see the burns restored. We want to see the burns removed. All that good stuff. Um, and we're just trying to get grassroots support to kind of help further all these efforts here. Um, but, you know, if there's anything that we can do to be helpful for you all, you know, if there's a donation that you'd like us to distribute, we will be on the Northern French Town here in the coming weeks. If there's flyers that you'd like us to distribute, we get more people to come with a keg, just for the donation of dollars for all of you, and we're happy to help out there. So, my last email is on this time, you should be able to reach out. Since you're not going to be able to help us, we appreciate all the work you've done, and some tremendous support for connection. What you need to get with the volunteers and uh, organize your uh, efforts for getting up. It's a travel for you all. Absolutely. Right, and it's a uh, university based project. Uh, we're based on campus. We're a non person, non profit, cultural, independent university. All oh, independent of the university. Right. And so, what areas are you canvassing? So far, we've just been canvassing this year. We're in the campus. I mean, what, what's your time frame? Um, we're going to wrap up campus in about the end of August, but we're hoping to talk to the students about the issue and uh, make it back on that. Okay, so when are you going to be canvassing in fresh time? The goal would be in the next couple of weeks, possibly starting through these next week, but uh, eventually we have that as well. So do you have like a map? Like you know, or how do you know? I guess that's the question. How do you determine? Yeah, because there's so many. Totally. Yeah, so we're going because there's so many. Like, what? Yeah, we do have like mapping. You know, basically, it's also like the people who sit there and sit down and gather what are the kind of challenges I'm working on. Personally, I've done a lot of things, a lot of different issues, but we've all heard about these issues in the past, but not a whole lot of pressure to do so. I'm looking at what we can do through the Mullen Board right there and just go for the most populations that make sense to actually not to do that. And I guess what's your agenda? What's your what's, what's the message? What's the idea? What's the message? So, you know, we're going out into the but for both of our aware, making sure they're aware that this is just say that as a council, you know, there's a little balance that we want to see this get cleaned up. Uh, that we want to see this be a priority for the EPA and we want to actually be taken. Uh, and that's what this kind of topic card is for really it's to be so that uh, EPA is actually going to deal with for all of the interim uh, legislative updates as well. It's kind of a target book that to keep us this fall, but just to be able to move us a little bit further down the line sort of this way. Well, we're actually getting members of the public to spend a lot of cards that might not be even aware that the EPA exists. So, you know, going out and, and getting other people to actually say, you know, I'm so proud to support getting action on Purple Stone that we don't even know that the issue is important. So, trying to really broaden the grassroots support for getting action is important. So, you're not working with, oh, go ahead. We do, we have one a list or a resource email about 
um, for each committee and the regional administrator urging us to take action. So I, I can say that those efforts um, will result in any email we receive by us to take action now. And I would say, like, I, and we, I'd love to get some great feedback about how to contact EPA and send people to the CAC, and I think that a point of a lot of our conversations today are like, we offer the additional sampling in the near future, and, and that hasn't been lost on me or on the other candidates. And so, but we have to get in the a lot of emails from folks about the need to get it. And she also has worked with the other partnerships in the United States, and the American Congress of Life Coalition, and other efforts here, so it's really for the other time. So how does that have been with the with COVID vaccine measures that were moving along? I think it's important that you know we're asking to be supporting this whole thing. I really want that to move forward, but it's sort of the bigger picture as well. It's just to build the ball for the future. So we certainly have a lot of things that we're going to be fed here today. So the information that we share with the geography today is new for you. Uh, it's not new necessarily, but it's, you know, when we're out having a conversation on the doors, we cannot go into as many acronyms and we go into the entire circular process of visiting your individuals, so it's really more of a state action that's moving forward. Obviously, we want something comprehensive and something we've done right. We just need to keep this ball moving forward here. But over 10 years, the site shut down, and things need to keep happening. Yeah, and I think from this group's perspective, if I'm and maybe not the scripts perspective, but I wouldn't want to speak for them, but, you know, from the Google County, I think we're excited that EPA has come to the table and demonstrated great strides in addressing the concerns of the community. And so, um, that's kind of hard to convey without an understanding of risk and where we are in the process, and that not a lot has happened for 10 years, but this is the culmination and the response to the 10 years of work to get to this point where we are. So it's a turning point and a fresh start in this relationship and in working together to ensure that this meal is what we need and what the community needs and the people who live here and work and play here in the future. And that, um, you know, is super key because the pictures that I share out about just tiny dots and big dots and what will actually get cleaned up is all dictated and is processed by the sampling. Yeah. And if it's not characterized, it won't be cleaned up. So that's why this characterization of sampling is key. So there's a specific line in our script that says, you know, we're grateful for the additional sampling. So we look forward to this. Yeah. I think we might be talking about it, but there's some other things that could happen now that are related to. And I think too, so because we've been working and we are surprisingly across the country for our coalition and community program, we've been working with Hunter with a sudden idea. He's about to fall, he's going to be talking to Hunter. And so he's been joining in on our weekly conversation about CSC at Coastal Coalition um, on this. And we are excited too about the initial sampling. This is a great relationship builder. This is desired by the CAC, desired by the county, it's much needed. And so it's our way of doing outreach because I've done about 30 community interviews um, out in the first county from area, and a lot of people, what I've been hearing back is nothing's happening. And so I think it's also a way for them to let the residents know new and old that there is this CAC, there is these meetings that are happening, you're welcome to come because, like it was mentioned previously, it can be tagging and can be very intimidating to people. It's intimidating to me, and I'm intimately involved in this, you know. So, to have just a normal person come out here um, can be kind of overwhelming. And so, it's just kind of bridging that gap and showing that their voice matters, whether it's a comment part or a question, because they're going to be documenting that as well. Um, because it is a it's a coalition effort, it's everyone, it's not just a single one. So if the CAC, I mean, it applies to the attention to Facebook group. So if, if that wants to be shared for the door, we're hopeful we're happy to do that. If we don't, we're also happy to do that if you're involved too. So I think there's some comments. I think you all probably need to do this. But, um, any other comments? Well, I want to thank all the presenters, um, Mr. Wintergrist, the Forest Service, 